In Jeremiah 6, we read this. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. We need to find an ancient path. I believe that the solution to understanding what happened to the family is in the past, in the ancient past. And so we're going to go into the ancient past and talk about some really, really old stuff. Uh, and this is where I believe we're going to begin to find this blueprint and where we've really left the path. Now, I, I've had this experience personally. I'll just tell you guys a little bit about my story. When I was 23 years old, uh, I was growing up in the Seattle area. And this is a place where families are really in crisis uh, in, in remarkable ways. I was a youth pastor and I was working a lot with public school kids. And man, it looked like family was just an experiment that had just failed. And my friends were opting out of family left and right. Seattle was the first city in the country to have more dogs than children because they were like, this is not working. Let's just find some other way to get this nurturing desire met besides having children. And so this is what I was seeing. And I was, I related to it. I'm like, yeah, what, what is the big deal? Why do we need to have kids? Why do, we, why do I need to be a father? And so this is, this is the, the, the way of, of my thinking. When I was plucked out of Seattle and I was doing a semester abroad in Jerusalem and I was there to study Hebrew, I've always been very interested in the Old Testament. I wanted to really get there at the roots. And I wasn't there to have a cultural experience, but um, I was sort of forced to. I was immersed in a completely unusual culture. And one of the things I kept noticing in this culture was fathers and children. It was in a way that I had never seen in the Seattle area. And so I just kept noticing everywhere I went. And there was one day when it really hit me, I was sitting on uh, a bench in the city of Jerusalem by the old city. And there uh, in front of me was a bunch of fathers, three or four fathers were all, and each of them were pushing strollers with all of these little kids in tow. And they were just walked right in front of me. And I watched them and I was like, that is really weird. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. I've seen, I've seen mommy brigades before, but I've never seen a daddy brigade. <laughs> Uh, and so I started to, you know, I, I assumed that, of course, I knew the truth about uh, family and fatherhood that, you know, I know kids are annoying. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense to, as a man to want to have children. But these guys, they haven't figured it out yet. But I am, in, I am in another culture, and maybe I should take a minute and just consider that perhaps they know something I don't know. I don't, it's, it's highly unlikely, but, but it's possible. Now, given the fact that there's, there's such a crisis of family in my culture, uh, maybe that's a good idea. And so I began to consider this. And by the way, this is a picture, a literal picture, a street sign in Jerusalem. It's so common to have fathers pushing strollers that they actually made a street sign out of it. Um, and so there's something unusual going on in this culture. So I started to ask various Jewish and Arab dads that I was meeting in the city. Like, they all wanted to talk about their kids. They all were so interested in their families. They all saw themselves, almost primarily their identity as father. They saw the world through that identity. And I was like, that's really strange. Can you tell me about that? And so when I was asking, particularly some of the Jewish fathers, they would say, well, I say, well, like, wh where did this come from? I just keep seeing this experience, these dads and kids everywhere. Where did that come from? And they'd say, well, it came from our Bible. And I was like, well, that's interesting because your Bible is actually just a section of my Bible. And so whatever you got in your Bible, I got in my Bible. So like, what, what kinds of things do you have in your Bible that, that really have led to this kind of culture? There's a, and so I started bumping into verses like this, you know, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Children are a gift. They're like a reward. And children born to a young man, a young man. Like I, when I think about a young man who with a, lots of kids, like joyful is the man is not the word that comes to mind. I think uh, a, a young man with a bunch of kids, it's like, you know, exhausted is the man whose quiver is full of them or broke is the man, um, but joyful is the man. Uh, why is scripture saying this? Now, you know, when you encounter a, a verse in scripture and it doesn't at all comport with what you believe, what do you do? And so I, I had to like, this is, the, this is like a repentance moment. Maybe, maybe there's something, again, maybe there's something I don't know. And so as I started to ask this question uh, with different families, uh, different fathers in particular, I kept hearing one word more than any other word. When I said, tell me about where this culture came from. They co constantly use this one word. They said, Abraham, Abraham, everywhere. The Arab dads, Abraham. The Jewish fathers, Abraham. I was like, huh, that's interesting, Abraham. And, you know, one of the reasons why that particularly struck me was I had actually spent the entire semester before studying Abraham under the, 
I, the, the arguably the greatest Abrahamic scholar in the evangelical Christian world at a seminary. I, I, I was in this intensive course where every single week we would sit with only eight of us and we would study the scriptures through the lens of Abraham. But not once did we talk about Abraham as a father. We talked about his, a man of faith and his connection to the gospel. But in these cultures, they, they, they thought about Abraham as a father. Now, I, I knew Abraham was really obsessed with his multi-generational family. He was crying out to God, make my descendants like the stars in the sky, make them like the sand. And I was like, I've never prayed that. That was just a primitive way that Abraham thought, right? I mean, Abraham sold camels when he was, I don't, you know, that was just a part of his culture. You know, I don't need to sell camels. Abraham was obsessed with a multi-generational family. I don't need to worry about that. That's a cultural thing. That's an old thing. That's something we've gotten past. But here I was in a modern culture where people that had thriving families and fathers loved their children in ways I had never seen. They were using Abraham's obsession with multi-generational family as the fuel for their fatherhood. I've never seen that before. So is, that, is it possible we've lost that? Is it possible that that is a clue back to an ancient path for why the family is in such crisis in our culture? So what is a family? Where do we go to find an answer to this question? And God himself talks about going back to Abraham. We read in Isaiah 51, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. Look to this father, Jesus even, when he referred to Abraham in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, calls him Father Abraham. Father Abraham. In part of the reason why I think in English we struggle with the connection with Abraham and fatherhood is because in Hebrew, it actually, you actually hear it in the language. The word Avram, that's the way the Hebrew pronunciation of his first name, Avram means exalted father. Av is father in Hebrew. And so every single time a Jewish person reads Abraham, they read the word father over and over and over again. Abraham means father of many nations. And so if Abraham, if Avram, Abram, is a exalted father, maybe that's a clue that we were supposed to look and understand fatherhood through the exalted father. This exalted father, the meta father, the father, not, not the perfect father. Abraham was a broken man. He made lots of mistakes. He was sinful. But I believe that we have in the scriptures, in Abraham as a person, the perfect example of how God interacts with the concept of fatherhood. And it's really right there in his name. And so what would it look like to imagine thinking about family the way Abraham thought about family? It's really difficult to talk to Western people about this because the difference is enormous. The way Abraham saw family and the way you and I see family today are probably very different, especially just the way Western culture in general. So I've created a little, uh, little animation for you guys to try to tease out the difference between the way Abraham might have saw, saw family and the way that we typically in the West think about family. So trying to answer this question for what is the family? So let's start with a Western family. The way, again, most typically we think about family in the Western culture. This is most Western countries. The way we think about a family is it starts when a mom and a dad come together. And every time that happens, we got, poof, a new family, right? So boy meets girl, get married. Congratulations, new family. Now, what is the goal of that family? The, the, the goal of a really good family in a Western context is to springboard the kids and launch them out. So you got a couple of kids, you want to launch them out, and then bam, they go. And so you're pushing them out, and your hope is that they would start their own family someday, and the whole process starts over. So one of the, one of the features of the Western family that thinks this way is that it has about an 80-year memory. That's about, that's about long. So if I were to take a poll here or anywhere in the Western culture, and I were to ask the question, hey, I need you guys to list to me the names of your great grandparents. Y'all had eight of them, so what are their names? Um, and most of us wouldn't be able to do that. Why? Because they're not relevant to our lives. We started over. What do they have to do with me? I didn't even meet most of them, or maybe any of them, right? So that's the way we think. We think that this is the way family's designed. We think it starts over every generation, so we don't need to know about our past. We don't need to understand our roots. We don't need to know where we came from. And so this is the way we think. And this is a very uh, different way to think about family. Oh, yeah, one more feature. Where, where the dad left. What happened to him? Um, all of a sudden, one of the two stools of the family. So one of the things that I think is important to point out 
is that there's something unique about this particular idea of family that is really hard for men. So one of the weird uh, things I'm going to present to you guys or, or, or I'm going to suggest is that one of the reasons why fathers struggle so much with fatherhood in our culture is because of this definition of family. There's something about this definition of family that does not re resonate deeply with men. Sometimes the answer isn't just to say, love your kids more, do your duty more. Sometimes our whole idea, our whole mindset is, is somehow corrupted, and this is causing the problem. Now, let's contrast this idea with the way that Abraham would have saw family. This is a classical family. Now, the way that, that Abraham saw family was the way that most cultures in history thought about family. And so we're going to look at this. This is also the way that, that family is described in every single book of the Bible, both Old and New Testament. What does it look like? Well, a family starts in this idea when a patriarch casts a vision. This is a particular father who sees something different into the future and says, I want to take my family somewhere new. And so you are saying, we're going to start this business. We're going to move to this new land, right? We're going to worship this God. This is how Abraham's family started. Abraham's father was an idol worshiper. His name was Terah. We don't worship the God of Terah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know why? Because he left that father. He started a new family line. The, the family and the God, he worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this is who we worship. And, uh, and so what happens after this patriarch casts a vision? You have a multi-generational attempt to, to achieve the vision. So from one generation to the next, we're trying to work on this vision. We're trying to establish this kind of a family. And if this occurs, we have this really unusual kind of family, at least in our culture. This is a family legacy. A legacy is when the, the multi-generational family has achieved that, that vision that that patriarch and matriarch began to set off on. And by the way, of course, the word patriarch is, uh, is under hard times. I know that in these days. Um, but part of what we want to be really careful, especially here on Father's Day, is to understand that a patriarch is simply the, a, the expression of a father who is leading his family in a visionary way. That's what its original meaning was. And so we want to make sure that we don't let the enemy corrupt this word. Um, and the Bible uses this word in a very positive light. We need to understand it also in a very positive light. Now, if you have a family like this, what happens? You get about a thousand year memory. Families like this have about a thousand year memory. And so this is why you have so many genealogies in the Bible, because they really care about their root structure. They really care about where they came from. I, I, I was having a conversation with a friend once about this. And he's like, you know, I, I know somebody who thinks this way is a friend of mine. He's from Korea. Can I put you guys together? This is during COVID, so we just like connected over Zoom. And so I'm having this Zoom call with this man, and uh, this man from this Korean man, he lives now in Texas. And, and I was saying, okay, I heard about you have this, this multi-generational family. Tell me all about it. And he's like, I, uh, like, you want to talk about business? No, no, I want to talk about your family. You want to, it literally took me about 20 minutes just to get him to talk about it. He's not used to talking about his family. He's a very successful businessman. But I was like, no, I want, I want to know about your family. <laughs> I heard that you have a multi-generational family. Tell me about how that works. He's like, oh, Yes, well, I'm the 30th generation in my family. My first name actually means the 30th. My son's name means the 31st. I was like, well, tell me about that. He's like, yeah, a thousand years ago, there was a member of our family who was a general and he was able to do some great things for the king of South Korea. And so we were given this multi-generational land and now there are tens of thousands of us that gather out on that land every single year. And, and I know as, as a 30th member of my family that I memorize the names of every single one of my descendants that all the way back to this thousand years before. And in fact, he got so excited, so animated, he like runs over, grabs this enormous book from his bookshelf, opens it up, he said, here's my family tree from a thousand years. I was like, oh my gosh this exists today. <laughs> and so this is a different kind of family. You can create this kind of family. You can decide to do this. You don't have to do the kind of family that we're building in our Western culture. There's something broken about this kind of family. 